Hello and welcome to Garden Chatter, where we connect gardeners, bloggers, and experts so we can all grow and learn together. I'm super excited. Tonight we have Benjamin Vogt on to talk about Monarch Gardens. So we'll be getting to him in just a moment and uh, hopefully learn tons about monarch butterflies. But first, let's check in with my co-host, Bren, and see what she has to share about getting connected with us at Garden Chatter. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you're having a great summer. So, Well, it's not really summer, but it feels like summer, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It's been so nice. Uh, a lot of rain out here in the Midwest. But anyways, joining us on the Google Hangout, you're going to want to take your cursor, click right up at the top. You'll get a grid. Click on the grid. You'll see a Q&A. If you hit that Q&A. You'll get a nice little comment section on the side where I hope you'll ask questions for our awesome guests tonight or just say hi so we know you're out there. And then also you can join us on the hashtag garden chatter. Um, if you click over to connectsharegrow.com, there's a big logo there with our guest host picture. Just click it. You can watch the live stream there and tweet from the page and, and all that. I think, I think we, we've got it all covered. So you can find out more now to, about monarch butterflies. Adam? All right. Well, we'd love to hear your questions if you have any questions for Benjamin Vogt. Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing over there? Tolerable still. <laughs> Tolerable. You say he was getting lots of rain over in uh, Nebraska. So why don't you just take a moment and tell us a little bit about um, how you got into gardening and natives and monarch butterflies and a little bit what, about what you're up to right now. Well, that'll, that'll take six hours, so I'll try and curtail it. Clip notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got the I got the gardening bug from my mother, like I think a lot of us do, but it didn't it didn't germinate until my wife and I bought our house when I was 30 or so. So I, I told my wife we're going to have a garden. Uh, she didn't know what that meant when 20 cubic yards of mulch showed up, and um, she had to help me spread it. So 1,500 square feet later, we had a garden, and yeah, you know, I just went to the nursery and I I, I didn't know what I was doing. I I bought. I looked at the plant tags and it said sun and wet or sun and dry, so that's what I got and stuck it in the ground. One of the plants happened to be a milkweed. One day I saw a bunch of caterpillars on it and halfway to the garage going to get some spray, I'm like, well, maybe I should Google to see what those caterpillars are. And there I go. There, you know, just, you know, right from there, learning about monarchs, learning about insects, pollinators, other caterpillars, native plants. And so... Yeah, now I'm now I'm like Mr. Native Plant, all yeah. gung ho. Save the prairie. <laughs> when you when you started your garden, do we, were you what were you thinking? Were you thinking you just wanted to make your yard beautiful, or did you want to grow food maybe, or anything oh, like not that? Food. Not food. That's too hard. Oh. <laughs> I, I know well, people will say no. It's not it's not hard. But I, I tried to do vegetables a couple years ago, and I, the way I garden is I just stick a plant in the ground and if it grows, great. If it doesn't, then I'll try something else. You can't awesome. do that with vegetables. Yeah, that doesn't always work too well with vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> a few, but a few. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I just wanted a perennial garden, grasses, have it look pretty, somewhere to retreat to, run away from my wife in. <laughs> hmm. Wait, I thought that's what the barn's for. <laughs> <Right? Yeah. laughs> that's how it is over here. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think all I think my other my only option would be the garage. So yeah, <laughs> how fun! So I'm kind of I'm surprised you found milkweed at the garden center. I don't really see that around here. Uh, the big surprise I've had it was like a thistle. A thistle is like a flower. It's not a weed, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a weed in my yard. I pull them. They're horrible. So yeah. so they actually were selling milkweed. Yeah, you know, and you you still see milkweed for sale. It's usually just the orange butterfly weed, tuberosa, okay. or swamp milkweed, or a cultivar of swamp milkweed. Um, but still, I hear from you know, I, I design gardens. I hear from clients all the time. Where do I find native plants? I can't find them. And I'm like, yeah. I know it's crazy. Like <laughs> hell. <laughs> right. Yeah, you'd have to kind of search out the the native plant nurseries. Hopefully, that might be yeah. you know in the area, but yeah. yeah. We, we, we have a great uh, great arboretum system here in Nebraska, obviously called the Nebraska Statewood Arboretum, and they have plant sales where they have a lot of native plants in the spring and in the fall. So I tell all my clients, everybody, go there first. That's it's great. It's fantastic. 
So you planted, um, so you found caterpillars on the milkweed, and then you did a little research on monarchs. And now, are, do you have milk meat, milkweed everywhere? <laughs> oh, yeah. What did it look like? How did you how did you transition into uh, getting more monarchs come into your garden? Yeah, de de definitely got more milkweed, and and this year I, I scattered. I I've got I got one bed where it's just a cultivation bed where I've got six different native plants that I'm growing this year. And I got one section that's I don't know three feet by five feet, and it's got about fifty or a hundred milkweed, little milkweed seedlings coming up right now. So if you want some, come over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably give them away. So. Yeah. <laughs> they um. So um. Yeah. Is there just like I'm just familiar with the milkweed? It kind of grows wild out here along. The board. I'm actually. I have been tweeting. I've been finding milkweed in the strangest places this year. I don't know if some butterfly or something is carrying it and just dropping it all over. Um, is that how that works? <laughs> oh, it's probably just seeds blowing around. You know, okay. they, they, they do come up in strangest. I'm I'm sure you're seeing common milkweed, Asclepias uh, syriaca. Okay. That's the most common one. It's got the got the big leaves and fuzzy on the bottom. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Yep. They'll pop up everywhere. Yeah. Of course, you know, you know, now with genetically modified crops and all those fields, nine, something like was it ninety nine percent of common milkweed is, is in the wild just isn't there anymore because of all the spraying that goes on. So up to gardeners. Yeah. <laughs> Um, are there other plants that you can use in your garden to encourage monarchs to come? Sure. Well, I mean, obviously. You know, talk about milkweeds. We have a, over 140 species of milkweed in the United States. Oh, really? So, yeah, no, people don't know that. You know? <laughs> but, the, but the strange thing is only about a dozen of them are really ones that milkweed, that, that monarchs like to lay their eggs on because, it, you know, they have the chemical in there. Oh, what is it called? Um, cor, cor, cardinalides. You know, okay. it's, that, it's that chemical that makes them toxic and birds don't like to eat them. So only about 12 milkweeds are really, really toxic enough for them to lay their eggs on. Really, but yeah, so, you know. How do you how do you know if it's the right kind of milkweed? Was that? Uh, there's, you know, I think I think it was Monarch Watch who 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 posted a, a list of those, did a did a whole spreadsheet of those, and and then showed you the top twelve. Okay. I don't know the link off the top of my head. So. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see if we can uh, look it up later. But yeah. Monarch Watch, huh? that'll be good. Yeah. Check that out. Um. Yeah, I was wondering, maybe just as a little review, what, what just remind us of what is the uh, monarch life cycle and you know their migration and that. What, what are they looking at? Yeah, well, they they overwinter overwinter in central Mexico for eight, seven, seven or eight months, and then they all they all start to come north. If that that, over, that generation of overwinter comes up in the Texas and the southeast, lays their eggs, dies. And that generation moves forth, and then the next one moves forth, and then eventually by the end of the summer, they're up in the southern Canada. And that fifth generation up in southern Canada then goes all the way back down to central Mexico to overwinter for their eight months. So when you're, and then when you're raising monarchs, um, you know, the female will lay the egg, the egg hatches in about three days. Then after about 10, 14 days, your caterpillar is huge and eating tons of food. And turns into a chrysalis, and then 10 to 14 days later, you have a butterfly. So how's that for a summation? That sounds good. I guess I wasn't realizing that they went kind of in waves of generations moving north. Um, yeah, yeah, and and you know, m most of the monarchs actually the, the main breeding area is in the upper plains, upper Midwest. So Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. That's the major hub of breeding, and then the monarchs move east and, and north from there. So if you don't see very mon very many monarchs and New Jersey or New York, it's basically because they're not doing well out here in the northern plains. So. Okay. Yeah, and I, I read that um, on the west coast where I am, they tend to winter in California or maybe maybe in Mexico, and then I guess they just head up the west coast and and then back down again. Is that? Yeah, there's there, there's that western population that does their own thing over there. So. It, <laughs> It doesn't get as much press, uh, but you know it's it's slowly declining too, just not as fast as the central flyway is. Hmm. Hmm. I was wondering, like, what is kind of the snapshot of um, the monarch population right now, and like, like sort of where it's come from, and where are we at, and is it 
trending, you know, worse, better, holding steady right now. Trending worse since 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 the mid '90s. Uh, the record, I think, you know, we we gauge your population by what the overwintering numbers are down in central Mexico, and it's mid '90s, late '90s. They were at something. They were occupying something like 20 acres or something like that. I used to have all the me numbers really memorized. So. <laughs> Um, but then it went down to like an acre and a half uh, the year before, and this last winter it was something like two or two and a half acres, so it's really bad. Um, but, you know, we have all these initiatives, these pollinator flyaways, talking about the I-35 is maybe going to be uh, seeded on the, on the roadsides with pollinator habitat, and, you know, it's big news, uh, bees, bees and monarchs, and it's about time. One in three bites of food comes from pollinators. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I was I was also wondering, like, where in their um, life cycle are they most vulnerable? Is or like, are we losing most of them? Is it in their migration? Is it, you know, the milkweed up where they're breeding, or what? You know, where where is the, the biggest problem with that? Yes. <laughs> yes and yes everywhere. <laughs> or? All of that. Well, you know, a female monarch will lay three, four hundred eggs, and what ninety eight percent of those will never turn into a butterfly. So. Hmm. And of course, then if you have 99% of common milkweed gone from the from the main northern plains area, so yeah, no milkweed. Uh, then then the then the young get eaten. Then you know, trucks hit them. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and then you know if if there's a drought, you know, and there's just there's just not enough nectar plants and not enough milkweed. We had that in 2012, a really big bad drought out here in the plains, and just knocked everything back. Next year. In 2013, just not very many pollinators at all out there, and especially not monarchs. So drought can affect them, even if it's too too rainy. Mm -hmm. so, um, they don't like rain and cold weather down in central Mexico in the in the winter. They sort of need to be right at 40 degrees and not having too much rain and having that rain not freeze on them over the winter. So hmm. that's interesting. I know we have a we have a neat little butterfly house up here in Ohio, and it's always neat to go in and just see. Just they're just so beautiful the way they you know they flutter and all that. <laughs> Do you see? Um, I I think those places are useful because it teaches kids more about the butterflies. Um, I did locally see a decline from, you know, when I first started blogging, it seemed like there were a whole bunch, you know, and then it kind of fell back a little over the last four years or so, but the last two years, I've really, you know, if I count at least 10 monarchs in my yard, I'm pretty excited, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I, I raised 140 from egg to wing last year. Wow. Um, is that hard to do? Uh, well, it, it is when you when you have 50 caterpillars at one time. <laughs> that can be, you know, my, my, wife, my wife looks at me, you know, I got a 10-gallon aquarium on the kitchen table, and it's just, it's just crazy. Oh, that's cool. It's, oh, so, I don't know if it's cool. I, I got the 10-gallon <laughs> aquarium from the, from the trunk of some 10-year-old girl's car in a McDonald's parking lot, and her brother <laughs> helped me buy it because I found it off Craigslist. It's, it's weird. No, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's that's good. A, yeah. So, um, like, can anybody do that? Could anybody take, like, I don't know, can you order monarch eggs or something and do that? Don't, don't do that. Oh. No, but you, you, you want to collect <laughs> eggs that are local because if you're if you're getting eggs from other parts of the country, you might be unknowingly spreading diseases and, and things that you okay. don't know about and, and infecting different uh, populations of monarchs. So you don't you don't, you don't want to do that with butterflies, bees or or humans. Well, maybe humans are okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <them> <laughs> So, yeah, that's good advice. I didn't really realize that. Um, so look for local source. And then as far as just collecting them locally, though, I wonder how uh, how do you go about doing that? Any suggestions? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, you, well, first you just need to grow milkweed in your backyard and, 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 and as many native plants as you can because these are plants that the insects and the butterflies know. They've evolved with, so they know the nectar. They know when they bloom. They like them. You know, monarchs especially like things out, out here like stiff goldenrod and, and New England aster and, and Joe Pieweed. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things I grow. There's a there's a liatris that's native just north of here, but I grow it anyway, sort of cheap because it's they just go bananas over it. It's called Meadow Blazing Star, uh, Liatris ligula stylus. And at one time I had ten monarchs on one plant just all at once. Wow. So I wonder that, if that grows in Ohio. I need to find that. 
Well, it, it, it's not native to Ohio. It's native to the northern plains like Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota. But, you know, we all cheat, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. So, did you say it was the meadow blazing star? Yeah, Latris Ligula Stylus is the Latin for any geeks out there. So, yeah, grow your own milkweed. Grow your own milkweed, and, and then you'll see the little eggs on there. They look like little sesame seeds, and just just bring it, bring that whole leaf in. Um, you, you know, that's, that's okay to do. Bring the leaf in with the egg on it, put it in a sealed container, and in a couple of days you'll have a tiny, 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 tiny little caterpillar. And you just keep eating it. And, and once it gets really big, you got to really keep up with cleaning out, cleaning out the poop because they poop a lot when they get bigger. <laughs> wonder if you can yeah. use that as compost. <laughs> Probably could. <laughs> Not too much, but you get enough like, of them, I guess. I like to sprinkle it on my donuts. <laughs> Yuck. Here, okay, so I got this little caterpillar here. We usually don't have them. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I'm going to put it up to the screen. You tell me if you can I see, see it. it. Oh, see yeah. It? So we usually don't have these, or I usually don't have them in my garden until July 15th or so. So it's neat to have one a little bit earlier this year. So geeking out. Yeah, yeah no, that's cool. That. It's cool. And, uh, peek at one. Yeah, I had some milkweed uh, over in a corner and um, just you know kind of wild as a weed. I hadn't planted it and did have a nice uh, monarch caterpillar or two on it last summer. That was exciting. Yeah, that's very cool. You know, yeah. cool. I, I always love it when plants pop up where you don't expect them. I, I like that serendipity. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose I'm just guessing here that if you were going to advise someone who just had a typical sort of lawn and um, shrub um, yard and they wanted to attract uh, monarchs, um, milkweed, milkweed and milkweed? Or what if, is there anything else they should add beyond just milkweed? Well, you, you, I mean, you, 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 want, you want native nectar plants at, too because that's what's going to bring in, that's what's going to bring in the adults. Um, you know, a, a trick I do is so, here, swamp milkweed really seems to be preferred by the monarchs and stop by my garden. So I'll put some swamp milkweed, which doesn't need wet soil, medium is fine. I'll put that milkweed by that metal blazing star, you know, within a few feet. And you got, you got monarch heaven, right? Because the adults are coming from the nectar, and they're like, oh, what's that? Milkweed, I'll lay some eggs. Cool. Okay, so you need the combination. You need both, you know, the nectar to attract the adults and then the milkweed yeah. for... Yeah, and, 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 then, and, then, and then don't just have one milkweed, have three or five or seven because, and same thing with nectar plants, because it's easier for pollinators to see them when they're flying way up, way up high to see a grouping of them than just one single plant. Wow, okay. Hmm. All right, so we need to check out the top 12 milkweeds, Bren, and uh, get, yeah. get planting. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't, it's interesting, they like a grouping of it, but they seem to really like my Joe Pie weed that I have. I don't, I'm not very good with the names, but I know it's a native because I got it from a local herb native group, and um, I kind of let it get, you know, some people say, oh, don't put Joe Pie weed in your yard, it's a weed, and it just overtakes, but I just kind of grow it like a huge shrub, and wow. man, that thing just gets loaded with all kinds of butterflies and moths, too, but, and the bees, they all love it. So that's a neat plant. And, and the other great thing about Joe Pye weed, now, there's lots of different Joe Pye weeds, but I know the one you're talking about, Brent. Okay, real tall, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love it. Yeah, I've got one that's 10 feet tall or something. Anyway, yes. the, the stems are hollow, right? So in the spring, yeah. when you cut down your garden, because you do wait until spring to cut down your garden because there's stuff sleeping out there, yes. those Joe Pye weed stems are hollow. So you mm -hmm. cut those stems into six-inch lengths, bundle them up, put them on a fence, and you've got a native bee house. So like mason bees nesting in them. That's cool. Yeah. We, we have several in our, in our garden. So. That's, That's a good neat. idea. Yeah. Yeah, I have one in my front yard, too, and it's uh, about 12 or 15 feet tall. It's quite tall, and um, I just have to prune it back every once in a while so it doesn't get too, you know, because it'll send all these verticals up, and they get a little crazy, so I like to keep it cleaned up a little bit. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Benjamin, I am uh, going back to teaching second grade in the fall, and um, sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's all right. So, if if you had, um, is there any curriculum or I don't know things I should do with my students that you'd like to see lots of elementary teachers doing uh, with kids to get them excited about uh, monarchs or any resources online I should look up? 
Resources online, I don't know, but that's what Google's for. Um, yep. I wish that every school in this country, from preschool through college, had pollinator gardens right outside. You could have art classes working in it, biology classes working, English, history, whatever, you know, and I hope may, maybe at your school you can advocate for that if they don't have one already. I think that's really important to for kids just to go out on recess or, or after school to walk right outside and look, there's a milkweed, there's a caterpillar on it. You know, oh, we learned about that in class today. I actually touched a caterpillar. You know, then, then you've got them hooked, right? I think, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We actually have uh, at our, the school I teach at um, a butterfly garden, and it's in the shape of a butterfly. It's, I don't know, 30 feet by 20 or something. Cool. And, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it needs some work, so that could be a project to, to do. Um, you know, it's been a little neglected, and I need to check and see how much you know water it gets in the summer and stuff. So it's still there. It's still intact. I just don't know how productive it is right now. I, I guess that figures being in the in the Pacific Northwest, you all are progressive, right? <laughs> I don't know about all of us, but um, <laughs> we had a, a teacher there uh, that you know definitely ad advocated to get that put in. And you know, it was neat. We had all the kids make special little tiles. Unfortunately, they 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 froze. They got wet and froze, and they popped. So we had this concrete border in the shape of a um, butterfly with all these kids' tiles on it. It was beautiful, but they kind of popped loose, unfortunately. So. Yeah. so what else should we talk about? <laughs> I enjoy following you. On, um, you're pretty active on Facebook. You used to be on Twitter more, but you're more on Facebook. You uh, keep pretty busy. Yeah, right? well, I've got, I got, I got my main account called Milk the Weed on on Facebook, and I do a oh. do a lot of sharing about uh, native plants and pollinators and how to help them and interesting environmental links about all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, twi Twitter's crazy for me. I, I used to. <laughs> it's just I don't uh, you know I think I think I'm more going towards Facebook and Instagram now. So. Yeah. yeah, that's good because those native plants are pretty. Instagram's a great place to. Show yeah. up. Just use the hashtags, right? Like pollinator yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. Native plants, prairie. Yeah. yeah. Garden you chatter. Garden chatter. <laughs> yes. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and That's dirt. a good hashtag too. Yeah. That, okay. <laughs> so I was wondering also, um, just curious, what you because I know you have um, your monarchguard.com site, and that you're doing consulting and some. You know, site design and plant lists and things. Could would you be willing to tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, I I I do. I go over to people's houses. I've been to schools and businesses as well. And I just uh, we sometimes with a consult, we just walk around and and they want general gardening advice about you know what do they need to prune? Is this a weed? What kind of native plants would you put here? And I'll just tell them in our hour consult. And then sometimes people call me and say, Hey, I've got a thousand square feet. I want a pollinator garden. Let's do it. Yeah, you know, so I'll, just, I'll, I'll design them up a, a, a garden. Um, I'm, pr I'm pretty big in the native plant communities, artistic plant communities, um, plants plants that would be together in the wild. I try to put them together in people's gardens as best I can. Slightly different growing conditions, but I try to make it look pretty and be low maintenance and, and ecologically sustainable at the same time. So. That's what I'm thinking about when I design gardens and I give people a blueprint and give them pictures of all the plants I suggested and I say, this is how you do it. These are where you can go get your plants. Now, go for it. So you don't do the actual install, you just do consults and yeah, not, design. Not I'm, I'm hoping to do installs in a couple of years and, and get to that point. So Right now, I'm just sort of getting my feet wet, learning the ropes. So. Very good. Yeah, I think I first um, noticed you on um, you were doing a guest post on the native uh, is it native plants and wildlife gardens. Yeah, um, I, I like that one. And I saw your your name up a few times on there. Yeah, I I, I post every ninth day of the month. So my my last one was up um, a couple days ago or a week ago. It was about the art of selfless gardening. So I'm really big into ethical reasons to be using native plants to support other wildlife and, and during climate change and habitat loss. Um, so, you know, me, me and the Pope, we have coffee, we talk, you know, <laughs> we hear ideas. That's, um, 
Wait, one thing you, I, I can't help but thinking about is like the native plants. Um, there, I don't think people realize or pollinators and all that that um, they're pretty easy as far as like drought tolerant things like that for the most part, aren't they? Well, that's that's a little bit of a misnomer. It, it's more about the right plant for the right place. Okay. Um, Obviously, if you put a plant that likes it really wet and you put it on a sand dune, oh, you're, sure. like, oh, you're in trouble. Sure. So, okay. So yeah. So I mean, the native plants, uh, as long you know, ad adapted to where they're going to be in your garden. So, okay. And that takes research. I like to go to Missouri Botanical Garden, Prairie Moon Nursery, um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to research native plants, figure out where they should go. That's neat. <laughs> I get confused too because like pollinator or pollinators and native plants are not they're kind of they're different. Not all native plants are attract pollinators, right? Right. I mean, you know, ninety percent of what is it? Ninety percent of of insects will only reproduce on on native plants. Um, but yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean they're just use, they're, they're using the flowers. They could be laying eggs. Um, native, okay. you know, so, so some bees will. We'll carve out little little strips in the leaves to take back to the nest to, to make a brood cell. Um, cool. uh, so and they use specific native plant leaves for that. So hmm. yeah, there's all kinds of pollinators: wasps, bees, moths, yeah. beetles, all kinds of stuff. That's cool. I get a lot of those little white moths. They like to eat my cabbage. I'm gonna say the cabbage worm ones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of those. <laughs> Cabbage whites, yeah, I think they're they're from Europe or Asia or something like that. Are they a bug? Because I don't know if I like them. <laughs> I, I I don't like them. <laughs> they yeah. do. They'll 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 chomp they down your that. broccoli and yeah. Mm. <laughs> they are quite um, prevalent though. Yeah. <laughs> quite persistent. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I was just thinking if anyone has um. Before we wrap it up this uh, this time, uh, a question for Benjamin. They could um, what could they do? They could they could tweet it with hashtag Garden Chatter, or they could um, join our our conversation live here and um, post us a question or comment. We'd love to hear from you. You could show up at my house. <laughs> that. <laughs> yep. Pop in on the screen there. Absolutely. Well. <laughs> I guess if we don't have any more questions or comments, we'll just um, wrap it up. So, well, Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm interested to uh, kind of follow what you're up to and want to look at some more photos. You've got some great photos on your uh, website, monarchguard.com. Like short for garden, huh? Monarch Guard? Yeah, monarchgardens.com monarch was already taken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of like it because it's a little play on words, you know, monarch, guard, guarding, oh, yeah. it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you know, when you're there, you can link over to my blog and, and my Instagram account and stalk me. <laughs> okay. I'll follow you. Stalk you. Say hi. Um, yeah, absolutely. And let's see, Brandon, do you have any last thoughts or comments? Not really. I think, well, you know, I had a question. It's about spirea. Because I have a lot of different spireas in my yard, and I don't think that's a native. But um, the bees and the, the butterflies, they really love that bloom on that. So I don't know, like, it, it's not bad to plant shrubs and things like that if you know they attract butterflies and whatnot, right? Well, if you know they're attracting a lot and you know that they're attracting a diversity of species... Um, I, I always prefer to plant things now. I didn't used to, but now I prefer to plant things that um, are also attractive. The flowers are also attractive, and the leaves are attractive. I want my plants to do double duty, host host the young and host the adults. Yeah. So, you know, I, I ripped out a spirea a couple weeks ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important, like you said, grow, grow what you love, right? Grow what you love and think of nature while you're doing it. Right, and hopefully that's milkweed and... And, yeah. and more and more native plants. Just, yeah. just get started. You'll get hooked. Awesome. May, may I ask what you put in um, instead of the spirea that you tore out? Well, I, I actually, it's just, uh, some, some, just some sedge and goldenrod right now. I'm trying to keep it simple in that area. I want to keep, I wanna keep it right, simple and clean. So. Very yeah. good. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and um, we'll follow, follow what you're doing, and 
yeah, appreciate Thanks. it. It's been a pleasure, and and feel free to read read my weekly articles on house dot com too. All right, we That's hadn't mentioned that. That's right, you do uh, articles for house too. Mm -hmm. Very good. Awesome.